Welcome to Abergavenny Baptist Church. Life, faith, together. Genesis 4, 1-16, Cain and Abel. Adam lay with his wife Eve, and she became pregnant and gave birth to Cain. She said, with the help of the Lord, I have brought forth a man. Later, she gave birth to his brother Abel. Now Abel kept flocks, and Cain worked the soil. In the course of time, Cain brought some of the fruits of the soil as an offering to the Lord. But Abel brought fat portions from some of the firstborn of his flock. The Lord looked with favour on Abel and his offering. But on Cain and his offering, he did not look with favour. So Cain was very angry, and his face was downcast. Then the Lord said to Cain, Why are you angry? Why is your face downcast? If you do what is right, will you not be accepted? But if you do not do what is right, sin is crouching at your door. It desires to have you, but you, mustn't ma- you must master it. Now Cain said to his brother Abel, Let's go out to the field. And while they were in the field, Cain attacked his brother Abel and killed him. Then the Lord said to Cain, Where is your brother Abel? I don't know, he replied. Am I my brother's keeper? The Lord said, What have you done? Listen, your brother's blood cries out to me from the ground. Now you are under a curse and driven from the ground, which opened its mouth to receive your brother's blood from your hand. When you work the ground, it will no longer yield its crops for you. You will be a restless wanderer on the earth. Cain said to the Lord, My punishment is more than I can bear. Today you are driving me from the land, and I will be hidden from your presence. I will be a restless wanderer on the earth, and whoever finds me will kill me. But the Lord said to him, Not so. If anyone kills Cain, he will suffer vengeance seven times over. Then the Lord put a mark on Cain so that no one who found him would kill him. So Cain went out from the Lord's presence and lived in the land of Nod, east of Eden. Well, good morning, one and all. It's good to be back here again with the sun shining brightly uh, and the rain stopping uh, so that we don't... I can actually drive over the bridge and not get flooded out. But as we come uh, and we have listened, as Claire reminded us, to all those uh, times of uh, conflict that we have all around the place... Um, we ask ourselves, wouldn't it be good if we could live at peace and not have all the fractions that are going on? And so with the story of a brothers living together, I'm going to start with a a, a short uh, video clip from a song, a, a, a musical you may remember if you are old enough. The cowman should be friends. Oh, the farmer and the cowman should be friends. One man likes to push a plow, the other likes to chase a cow, but that's no reason why they can't be friends. Territory folks should stick together, territory folks should all be pals. Cowboys dance with the farmers' daughters, farmers dance with the ranchers' gals. Yeah. Territory folks should stick together, territory folks should all be pals. Cowboys dance with the farmers' daughters, farmers dance with the ranchers' gals. <laughs> Oklahoma, of course, for those who didn't recognize the song, with the, uh, sorry, with the fringe on top and all the other ones, those of us of a certain age will remember. Just before Oklahoma becomes a state in the United States, the cowman and the farmer. Unfortunately, they weren't always very friendly. And in fact, if you remember the song, the two of them start to fight one another, rather similar to times up further north in Wyoming. Any of you remember Shane as the farmer hires the gun to keep the rampant rangers off the land? And so we remember Cain and Abel. Cain was a tiller of the land, and Abel was a herdsman, a grower of sheep, the one who kept the flocks. Maybe that murder that we heard of was the foretaste of an eternal rift that seems to go on and seems to echo throughout uh, history. 
And yet, that's not what the story tells. In fact, as we listen to the story of Cain and Abel, it's very light on reasons altogether. We're not told why God chose as he did. Why did he choose Abel's gift over Cain? Many have tried to give a reason. Many have said that sheep was the more costly gift, so therefore, obviously, he preferred the one who gave that which cost more. Some have said that offerings must always come with blood, but that's not mentioned as we hear the story. All we are told is that God chooses as he will. What we do know is that Cain did not react well to the choice. Instead, he lets resentment get the better of him. God speaks to him and says, Cain, yes, all right, there was a choice, a choice to be made. Now you deal with it, you cope with it. If you work how to live with it, all will go well with you. But resentment sits there and it grows. And despite the gentle guidance, despite the pro promise that the choice was not final, despite it all, Cain murders Abel. Challenged by God, like most of us who get challenged, he evades the issue. Ask what he's done. His response is to avoid any answer whatsoever. Why must I be shepherd to the shepherd? Am I my brother's keeper. And there's a rub. How do we respond to our sisters and our brothers? How do we react to God's choosing? Now, I'm an only child. I don't have any sisters or brothers, so I never had that experience of sharing my parents' love. I never had the joys nor the sorrows of sibling love and rivalry. It's lovely to see how close siblings can be, particularly when they are twins. But it's also sad to see how often they drift apart. All too often in my ministry, I have seen that. Siblings who cannot bear to be together, even living next door to one another, failing to speak to each other. And certainly that theme of sibling rivalry is one that echoes throughout the Bible. Brothers do not fare well in biblical stories, especially, I'm afraid, elder brothers. It's not just Cain and Abel who are at one odds with each other. Think of Jacob and Esau as he sells his birthright for a mess of pottage and the young trickster gets away with it. Think of Joseph and his siblings, the one with the well favoured by his father with his long sleeved, many coloured coat, who sits there and cannot do anything because he's encumbered by this beautiful garment. Think of Moses and Pharaoh, yeah, not strictly brothers, but Moses was an adopted son of the royal household, brought up by Pharaoh's sister living with Pharaoh. Think of Ishmael and Isaac. Yes, half-brothers. But their sibling rivalry still haunts us today, as we're reminded too often in the news. And it's not just the Old Testament where brothers do not get on well. Remember that story told by Jesus? of the two brothers, the prodigal we remember well who comes back having gone far from the, to a far country. But what of that other son out in the field doing his father's business? Echoes of resentment, echoes of that initial story, this brother of yours who was dead is now alive and the elder brother echoing Cain what do I care am I my brother's keeper we live 
in an age where it's too easy to spread ill feeling. Facebook and X, formerly known as Twitter, thrive on those stories of resentment. Often resentment that never was there to, there to be told in the first place. Often stories that are made up. But really, if you want a story to go, nasty, go viral, just say something nasty and see how often it spreads. Perhaps it ties into sibling rivalry of those initial stories we've lived with. And yet, there is hope. It can spread. Often in my Facebook feed, I get that post which says, if only we could spread love as quickly as we could spread hate and negativity. What an amazing world we would live in. But how do we do it? Catherine Tate, playing Lauren Cooper, her alter ego was well known for her catchphrase, I ain't bothered. I can't be fussed about it. A phrase that can't sum up feelings of many of us as we listen to the news, as we see what's going on around us. We ask ourselves, I ain't bothered. Is it to do with me? Am I my brother's keeper? But such filings are not confined to morality tales or comedy sketches. And in fact, it was long before Maggie Thatcher said, there is no such thing as society. There are only individuals, men and women, and there are families. It was long before that, that we had that feeling that perhaps selfishness gains everything. It was formalized as America broke from Britain by Adam Smith in his Wealth of Nations, suggesting that self-interest makes things better for all of us. I ain't bothered, I'll do what I want to do. It's not from the benevolence of the butcher, the brewer or the breaker that we expect our dinner, but their regard for their own self-interest. And of course, it's enshrined in the American Constitution, having broken from Adam Smith's land. A few years later, they enshrine the right to the pursuit of happiness, saying nothing at all about the pursuit of community. It even comes up in this year's Marks and Spencer's advert, a plea to do whatever makes you happy, even if it means hitting the Christmas elf for six or setting a blowtorch to Christmas cards. Perhaps the meatloaf lyrics try and make it a little bit better, as in the background you hear them sing, I would do anything for love, but I won't do that. But I'm not so sure. I ain't bothered seems to be the spirit of the age. Whether it be the drive to profit above all, or the instant response to social media, or the bigger issues, the failure to act on climate change the failure to act, to work for peace and justice. What resources do we have to make sure we are bothered, to remind ourselves we're part of a society, that we are our brothers and our sisters keepers? It's good when the kids were, were singing this morning about God's creation and all things. Because, of course, there is that old hymn from Francis, uh, St. Francis of Assisi, All Creatures of Our God and King. I don't know when the last time you sang that one here was uh, when you sang last time uh, Draper's versification of that canticle of the brother's son and the sister moon. A reminder that we must be bothered. For as the kids sung this morning, as St. Francis said in his canticle, all things are part of God's good creation. And so we are bound to all things, especially 
our sisters and our brothers. For each one of us is part of God's creation. Each one of us, particularly as men and women together, each one of us share in God's image. Of course, the powers of this world will try to divide us. Divide us by our perceived interests. Divide us by our nationality or ethnicity. Divide us by our religious affiliation. Telling us that they must not gain what we have. Telling us that if they have more, then we must have less. But Paul reminds us that's not the way it is. It should not be within the church, and by extension, as we are all part of God's good creation, it should not be beyond the church. For there is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave nor free, there is neither male nor female. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. We are all one in Christ our Lord. We are all one in this Christ who Paul again tells us is the full image of God, is the one who is the head in which all of creation joins together, is the one in whom everything coheres. So as Christians, we must be bothered. For we're bound to one another through Jesus Christ. And that binding, that oneness, that unity, we show each time we come together in communion. It's a very simple service. At times we take it for granted with the very simple images of broken bread and poured wine. And yet here we are feasting together. Here Christ is our unseen host who, as he did of old, has come to eat with sinners. Well, I'm not so sure how many tax collectors we've got here. I used to have one in my congregation in uh, Clanwen, but sadly he died a few years ago. But certainly come together with all of us who are sinners. Here we come and eat together, accepting and trusting one another. As you eat together, you accept the ones you are eating with. There was that rather unfortunate story in the news a couple of days ago of the feast in Australia, where someone apparently added some rather unfortunate mushrooms to the meal. We don't expect that to happen when we eat together. We are open to one another. We are accepting of one another. As we eat together, we lay aside all our differences. As we come in communion, we gather in Christ's presence with one another. And Jesus said, when you come together, when you come to bring your offering, make sure you're reconciled with one another. If you are coming together, And there is differences. First, lay aside your gift and go and be reconciled. Go and be bothered. Go and remember you are your sisters and your brother's keeper. Cain and Abel fell out. And the falling out led to murder. Cain was offered the chance to be reconciled, to change his heart, to do something different, but he couldn't be bothered. We come in a world where we have differences, we're in a world that isn't always fair, in a world where difficulty reigns, but we have the chance to change things. We are called to be bothered. We are called to be reconciled to one another in Christ Jesus, our Lord and Saviour. We are called to be sisters and brothers 
for we are all one in Christ our Lord. May we, as God's people, prove to be an example to God's world as we share that unity with one another and begin to show the, recon- the road to reconciliation in a world that finds it so hard, almost impossible to find the way to peace and to hope. Brother, sister, let me serve you. Let me be as Christ to you. Gary's going to come and play as we sing that song. Thank you for watching. For more information, please visit our website abgavenibaptist.co.uk